Hi everyone. Um, as I said, my talk this evening is about information overload um, and the real cost of interruptions. But first, a little bit of an introduction to me. Um, I'm Hannah Foxwell. I am a recovering DevOps consultant, um, hence why I'm here. Um, I'm now product manager at Server Density. Um, Server Density is a SaaS monitoring solution. Um, so if you want to monitor your infrastructure and you don't have time to build um, a fully baked solution yourself, you come to us. We do it in the cloud for you. Um, I'm also really involved in the DevOps community in London. So I'm organizing DevOps Days London this year. Um, it is on the 6th and 7th of September, and the call for proposals is now open. Please submit your stories. Um, I also call myself, um, depending on where I'm talking, it, this varies. So I call myself a human ops champion. Um, I actually organize a meetup called Human Ops in London, where we talk about the human aspects of DevOps and the human aspects of working with technology. Um, and just the very real human impacts of technology, which I'm going to touch on tonight. Um, I also am a hug ops enthusiast, so if you fancy a cuddle later, that's all good. And I'm a bit of a craft beer nerd, um, because apparently everyone in technology has to be a craft beer nerd. Uh, <laughs> I could go on and on and on. Um, but yeah, in summary, talk to me about um, DevOps days, talk to me about monitoring. Um, you can talk to me a bit about machine learning. I'm trying to learn a bit about that at the moment. Or you can just talk to me about hops. Um, I like those two. Um, so to start with, I want to share you um, with you a fantastic success of mine, actually. Um, I've got no unread emails in my inbox. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> Achievement unlocked. Um, how rare is this um, in this day and age? Zero unread emails. Um, and of course, it's not true. And um, that's the sad reality of um, the sort of day and age that we're living in now is that um, we're as likely to do a lap of honor around the office about getting through our inbox as we are about actually achieving one of our objectives or our goals of, as we are about our business's success because we're now overwhelmed with information that's coming at us from all different directions. And it isn't just email. We've got notifications and information um, coming from all of our different tools. And this is only um, a subset of them. All of our apps are generating information and throwing it in our faces. And we're having to process that day in, day out. Um, it's not just the Twitters and Slacks or hip chats or iMessages and emails of the world. Um, all of your tools are going to be doing this day in, day out. Um, so here, I'm here to talk to you about the impact that that has on you. I'm here to talk about information overload um, and distractions. Um, because working in technology, we are especially um, sort of have this in our face all of the time. And nobody is immune to this kind of digital disruption. It is essentially the digital disruption of our minds that we're talking about. Um, so to start with, I wanted to share a couple of facts with you. Um, the average person checks their phone 110 times a day. I think I do it way more than that, to be honest. <laughs> um, and I think if you went and you had a look at the, um, the younger generation, like the kids in school, I think it would be even higher than that again. Um, the average person is interrupted um, 11 times an hour by digital notifications while they're at work. And as employees, we generally only get three minutes of uninterrupted focus on a task at a time, um, which is a little bit worrying, isn't it? Um, and when you are interrupted, it can take an average of 23 minutes um, to regain focus. Um, so all of these notifications may feel like um, as a one-off, they're being helpful. But when they're en masse, um, we're causing real problems um, to the way we're working. And I started asking myself the question, uh, how are we getting anything done? Um, how much of this busy work is actually productive? Um, how much of my day am I spending just managing information? And how much time am I spending creating, thinking, problem solving? Um, and the answer was, not a lot. Um, I wrote this talk and uh, I, sort of, I proposed it for a conference initially because it was a problem that I was facing. And then when I went and did it, I was like, it was amazing what the response I got. Everyone is struggling with this stuff. Um, and 
not just as an individual level, but um, teams are struggling with this stuff. Enterprises are struggling with this stuff. And in fact, the economy is being impacted by the loss in productivity due to this type of stuff. Um, it's got a wide ranging impact. But we're a special breed, um, <laughs> us technologists. Um, developers really hate interruptions. Um, if you're doing some complex technical um, problem solving, um, it takes a little bit of creativity, a lot of knowledge, and a hell of a lot of concentration to have that light bulb moment and decide how you're going to solve a problem. And it isn't just limited to developers. Um, operations engineers, DevOps engineers, um, everybody's doing this type of problem solving in their day-to-day -day work. Um, and you really need your focus to be able to do your job. It was um, Joel Spolsky, who is the CEO of Stack Overflow, who said developers need to concentrate. The more things you can keep in your head at once, the faster you can code by orders of magnitude. And I completely agree with that. Um, so many times um, I've been to work and I've had, I've kind of got to the end of my day and I thought, oh shit, like, I haven't actually done any work yet. Um, I've just sort of responded to the things that came at me. Um, and it takes a sort of moment to step back and say, well, was that really what I should have been doing with my time? Um, because I believe that your time and your attention are and your focus are your most important resources. And there is always going to be more information to consume. The internet has made that um, uh, the availability of information infinite. Um, we really have to have more control about what we choose to consume because there is always more. One um, academic study into the behaviors of programmers at work found that uh, as a programmer, you're likely to get just one uninterrupted two hour session a day. Uh, I don't know whether you've ever worked in any teams where your estimates for how long something was going to take have been wildly <laughs> inaccurate, but I kind of believe that this is one of the reasons is that actually we're just interrupting um, we're interrupting each other all day, every day with our messages and our communications and we're bombarding each other. And actually all of us are so busy trying to communicate that none of us are getting anything done. Um, and it's a bit of a problem. Multitasking um, has been shown to sort of decrease your cognitive abilities um, as much as smoky weed. Um, so if you're sat at your desk and you think you're being productive, uh, if you're sat at your desk and you've got maybe more than one monitor in front of you, maybe you've got your phone out as well, maybe you're chatting in three Slack channels, you're responding to your emails, you're trying to write a little bit of code at the same time, you're having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with your colleague across the desk, you feel very busy, you feel very productive, you feel like you're the master of your universe, you're not getting anything done. And the things you are getting done, you're getting done to a much lower quality um, than what you would be doing if you were able to apply your entire focus to that job. Um, you might as well be sat at your desk smoking weed. And we kind of know what your manager would feel about that. <laughs> but it's your brain. Um, and this is how your brain works. It's playing tricks on you uh, because there's this chemical called dopamine um, which your brain really likes. It's basically your pleasure chemical. And every time you do a bit of busy work, you get a little reward um, of dopamine in your head. It's, it's only very tiny, um, but it reinforces that busy work is good um, and it distracts you away from focused work, um, which doesn't give you this kind of chemical sort of um, reinforcement. Basically, your brain is a little addict. Uh, it's a dopamine addict. And we need to be able to manage um, ourselves. Otherwise, our biology will basically reinforce um, these negative behaviors. Not only that, but multitasking in that way increases the production of stress hormones. So cortisol and adrenaline are going to be pumping around your, around your body. Um, and overproduction 
of these hormones in very extreme cases, um, they can actually cause you to have sort of clouded thinking, um, which again, doesn't sound like a great state of mind to be in when you're dealing with any kind of complex technical problem that you probably are required to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and if all of these external interruptions weren't enough, your brain really likes to interrupt itself. Um, so self-interruption is a thing. Thank you very much, brain. But um, one study found that the more external interruptions that, you're, um, that happen in your environment that are inflicted upon you, so the more of your colleagues who are doing like those fire and forget emails, the more interruptions you're receiving, the more text messages, the more people who are atting you on Twitter even, um, the more you're interrupted, the more likely you are to interrupt yourself um, during the following hour. So self-interruption can be, I've noticed myself doing it and it's the most infuriating thing. So self-interruption can be like, okay, right, I've got two hours and I'm gonna focus on this one task and you go and sit down to do, to do it. And then five minutes later, you realize you're doing something completely different. You're like, what happened? <laughs> so it's completely subconscious. And you're like, what happened? I, no, I didn't, I didn't, no one asked me to do this. I just, I just, flipped between tasks and it's because um, that whole saying neurons that fire together wire together the more you, that you behave in this very highly interrupted way the more that you flip between tasks the more that that your brain feels comfortable in that mode the more it's going to want to be in that mode um, and so it ends up reinforcing that and you end up doing it to yourself uh, maybe you're just going to get up to go and have a coffee maybe it's even um, as sort of sort of weird as when you think that you felt a vibration of your phone in your pocket if you get like a phantom notification and that's just your brain um, that's just your brain believing that something has happened because that's what usually happens um, if you think about the sort of mesh of neurons um, trillions and trillions of connections in your brain as being a forest um, those signal paths are going to want to go down the easiest route. If there is a well-trodden path through that forest, um, if a tiny signal in your environment is translated to you as my phone has buzzed in my pocket, that's what you will believe has happened. Um, it's like, it's the difference between going down the well-trodden path from a neurological point of view as, as going through the sort of thicket. Um, But this is not a talk about productivity. Um, <coughs> it's obviously a problem if we're not getting anything done. Um, it's definitely a problem if it's stressing us out. And I want to talk a little bit about the physiological impacts that this type of working environment will have on you. Um, and it is a problem. Email apnea is a thing. Has anyone heard of what e email apnea or application apnea? Um, so, Application apnea is the shallow breathing um, or breath holding while you're doing email or working or playing in front of a screen. Um, it sounds really odd to say it, um, to say that like, okay, well, when I open my email in the morning, I'm gonna hold my breath. Um, but 80% of people do it. Um, it's been measured. 80% of us hold our breath or will change our breathing in some way when we engage with one of these communication apps. Um, Changes to our physical sort of breathing, um, something so fundamental to us being healthy and alive, um, will increase our stress levels, um, which obviously will affect our emotional well-being and will obviously then have cascading effects, which will impact our ability to work effectively. Um, not only that, but the amount that we engage with technology and devices will affect our sleep. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I think actually, um, for a lot of us who work in technology, some of these statistics are far worse than the broad population. But one third of UK adults will check their phone during the night. Um, we're supposed to be resting during the night. We actually need rest. Um, that's, that's part of what it is to be human. Um, but one third of UK adults will check their mobile phone during the night. 
10% will check their phone as soon as they wake up. 52% will check their phone within the first 15 minutes of waking. Um, and it's been shown that reading from a device immediately before bed impacts the production of melatonin. You've probably all um, had a play with the configuration on your phone, so you can change it into night mode so that it doesn't admit emit so much blue light. It's that blue light that automatically signals to your brain that it's daytime, um, depleting the production of melatonin. And you need melatonin to have a good and stable night's sleep. And it should go without saying that you need sleep. Um, I'll keep saying it. <laughs> um, lack of sleep is linked to all kinds of um, ailments, obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, many, many more. Um, so why do we do it to ourselves? It's, again, it's that little dopamine addict in our head that's addicted um, to all of this information that we're consuming all day, every day. And what about our happiness? Um, what uh, about how we're feeling in ourselves? Um, there's a thing called FOMO, <laughs> which is becoming a, um, an actual sort of word in our vocabulary. I don't know whether any of you have heard of it. Yeah, you, you're nodding. It's, yeah, what, what, <laughs> tell us what it is. Fear uh, of uh, missing out. Fear of missing out, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's in our vocabulary now. So fear of missing out. Um, so, you know, well, lots of the time we'll point at social media as being the cause of our fear of missing out. But in a work situation, it can be, I know that there are 10 unread emails in my inbox and I do not know what they are and I, they might be important. It's that background noise that these notifications create for you that <coughs> actually can cause you a lot of anxiety. Um, it might be small, but um, everyone's going to deal with it in a different way. Um, there's going to be that, I don't know what's happening, I need to know what's happening, um, sort of thought process triggering off in your head, which is going to become, which could potentially lead to greater stress levels. Um, imposter syndrome, um, I don't know whether any of you are sort of familiar to, with like, the causes of that, but imposter syndrome, I think, is exacerbated by the amount of information that is available to us. And I think it's sort of, it's very similar to one of the questions that was asked earlier about like, there's all these new tools out there and oh my God, we can't keep up. It's all moving so fast. And that's, that's really the th kind of thought patterns um, that um, reinforce your maybe internal imposter syndrome. There is always someone better than you on the internet and it only takes a little Google search to find that person. Um, there is always more to learn and there aren't enough hours in the day for you to learn it. All of these things um, and all of this availability of information is, you know, is telling you, and if you're susceptible to it, it's telling you all day in, day out that you're not good enough. Um, and that can really affect your mental health. It can also lead to a feeling of a loss of control. It's... Um, I like to I like to tell my colleagues, although we actually we don't use email that much, but I used to like to tell my old colleagues that you know your inbox is not your master. Like you do not get your to-do list from the amount of emails that you've received during the day. You need to take a step back and you need to decide what's important. And I think if we allow these technologies to become our taskmasters and our task managers and they manage our time, then we lose control. And it can feel like that we don't have a say in how we spend our time. We're just responding to what the world brings us instead, um, which isn't a great way to exist. Um, feelings of loss of control can actually, um, they can actually lead to you sort of going down the sort of spirals of, I think, yeah, my next point is burnout, <laughs> spirals of burnout. Um, so if you don't feel like that you are having um, any autonomy or any decision making, um, you can get apathetic, you can get um, sort of cynical about your work, you can stop contributing at all. And this, that's what a lot of people can feel like if their inbox is ruling their lives um, and they can just burn it out. Um, so, actually, in this crowd, I haven't seen too many people messing with their phones, which is great. Um, but this is the point where I usually ask you to put your phones away. Um, because of, <laughs> as hard as it may be, you don't need to look at your phone for the next 10 minutes. Trust me, like nothing's going to go wrong. Um, so 
You if you should have said it in the beginning. I should have said it in the beginning, <laughs> but I've already. Uh, I wouldn't have convinced you why. <laughs> so yeah. Um, so if you haven't done already, let's put the phones away. Let's um, let's let's share the experience having a bit of FOMO together for the next ten minutes. Um, and as I've got your uh, undivided attention, it's a good time to start to talk about neuroscience. Um, I'm going to keep it at a high level. One, because if the brain were so simple that we could understand it easily, uh, we would be so simple that we couldn't. <laughs> and two, I'm not a neuropsychologist. So um, this is really, really high level stuff. But it's one of those things where once you're aware of certain factors um, about how you think, um, you are empowered to do something about it. So that's, that's why I sort of bring, bring the brain into it. And I'm going to start by talking about the attentional system. Um, there are four key components of the attentional system. The attentional filter, um, central executive mode, uh, mind wandering mode, and then the, there's the attentional switch. The attentional filter um, is the thing that takes in all of the different input um, from all of your senses and decides what's important and what isn't important. Um, it decides what's going to be escalated to your conscious mind and what isn't. Uh, so, for example, we're probably sat in here now and we're not really thinking about the colour of the floor unless it suddenly changed. Um, we're probably not thinking about the temperature unless all of a sudden it shot up to 40 degrees. Um, the attentional filter is just making a decision for us. It's automating that task. It's saying not important right now, not important right now, although we're being constantly fed that. Um, the attentional filter is the thing that will make that buzzing phone in your pocket um, interrupt your train of thought. Um, and we know how frustrating that can be. The central executive um, is basically your thinking mind. Um, so it's in your prefrontal cortex, which is the, the big gray matter in the front. Um, and it's basically the supervisory system, which allows you to consciously direct your attention. If you decide, oh, I need to think about this right now. And you sort of, you bring it into your conscious thoughts. Um, and which is essentially the opposite to mind wandering. Um, mind wandering is when you just as it says, let your mind take its own course. Uh, mind wandering mode is the thing um, that happens if you're, say, driving down the motorway and you miss your junction because you're, you were just elsewhere. Um, it's the thing that maybe gets you to work in the morning and you're like, I don't remember anything about my commute. Um, you were in mind wandering mode. Um, you weren't engaging the central executive. You weren't thinking actively um, about your commute, although you were still going through all the steps um, because you were just let, letting your mind wander. And both modes are very good for you, although obviously the central executive mode, the self-directed, top-down thinking is what you need to be able to do your job. It's what you need to be able to problem solve. And then finally, we have the attentional switch, um, which does exactly what you would expect. Um, it switches, switches you uh, between one thing and another. Um, the interesting thing about the attentional switch is that it gets really tired. <laughs> so, <coughs> excuse me. So, the more you flip your attention from one thing to the next, um, the more you go from one um, thinking mode to another thinking mode, your attentional switch actually gets a bit tired out. And that can lead to um, quite jumbled up, confused thinking, um, which again, not a great state of mind to be in. Uh, so, these four sort of factors in your attentional system all working together are absolutely great until you overwork them. Um, and the attentional filter is really the one that gets absolutely hammered um, when we've got notifications coming in all day, every day, because it turns out that the attentional filter has a novelty bias. Um, <laughs> and you can imagine why when you think about when we were like hunter gatherers in the desert. Um, oh, there's something new. There's something new in our environment and I don't know what it is yet and I don't understand it. Um, and you would have to investigate that because you don't know whether it's friend or foe. You don't know whether it's dangerous. You don't know whether it's an opportunity. So we have this sort of urge, this sort of um, this, um, this automatic bias in our heads to investigate things that are new and that we don't understand yet. But 
in an age of information overload, that's basically everything, isn't it? <laughs> and especially those things that are put in front of our faces via notifications. Um, so yeah, our brains really like shiny new things and we actually have to sort of consciously fight against that or we will open every single message as soon as it arrives. Which apparently is what most of us do. Um, <laughs> I think this is an absolutely uh, ridiculous um, stat, but it is, it is proven um, in this study that 40, there's a 40% chance that you are going to open a new email within three seconds of receiving it. Um, which is mind boggling really, isn't it? 40% chance that you're gonna open it within three seconds. That's no time at all. That's no time at all. That is the novelty bias in action. That is us saying, oh my God, there's something shiny and new and I must know what it is. And then it's like, okay, nothing to worry about. <laughs> you know, most of the time it's like, okay, nothing to worry about, but you've already, you've, you've had to go in and you've had to see it to make that decision. Otherwise it's gonna just bug you. Um, our brains also have a completion bias. Um, basically, this is the bit of your brain that is going to reward you for completing a task, regardless of its importance. Um, so deleting that email, yep, job done. That email is deleted. Um, get into work in the morning. I, okay, what I'm gonna do first is I'm gonna respond to all my email. Um, how many, like I do that, it's like the first job of the morning, how many people check your email, respond to anything that needs to be responded to. Um, and that's, that's your completion bias at work. It's going to, it's going to try to influence you to do the small, easy jobs first, because it's that little addict in your brain again saying, I really want to tick three things off my to-do list before like nine o'clock in the morning. Isn't that great? No, it's not great. Not if these were three things that actually didn't matter. Not if these were three things that could have waited till last week. Um, your time and your attention are so important that we really shouldn't be wasting um, on all these tiny little things um, that potentially, um, when you think about when you think about how uh, interruptions and self interruptions work, are maybe generating more distractions for your colleagues in the office as a result of them as well. Email generates email; um, it just breeds. Um, <laughs> Slack channels generate Slack channels <laughs> um, at the moment. Um, it doesn't matter what the medium is. The more we try and fire off these messages to each other, the more we're going to get back in return, and the more we're going to want to send more. Um, so somehow you have to kind of break this cycle. And the other thing about your mind is that your focus is finite. Um, the brain, just like any other organ, needs oxygenated glucose to function. Um, the brain actually burns through 20 to 30% of the oxygen, oxygenated glucose that you consume. 20 to 30% 20 of the calories that you eat will be burnt by your brain. Um, that's how busy it is. Um, as an organ and of course it can get depleted um, just like any just like any organ um, Can get tired just like your muscles get tired when you go running um, So you need to refuel um, The more you flit around doing busy stressful work the More you're going to tire out your brain and the less able it is to execute those tasks that were actually the most important thing for you to do today So I'm going to move on to the solution, because I've talked a lot about the problems um, and we don't want to be negative all night long. Um, so we can do things ourselves um, to help us get better at this. So you're probably aware that there's this thing called configuration um, and we really like to configure things, but how often do we go into our apps and just switch off those notifications or to put ourselves on do not disturb if we don't want to be disturbed? Um, we can make choices that make this a lot easier for ourselves. Um, it's just about getting into the habit of doing so. Um, actually doing a brain dump, uh, when you have something on your mind and you know you need to do it, it's gonna play on your mind and it's gonna cause you to, you know, it's gonna cause you to get more tired and to be distracted until you deal with it. Just writing it down, 
or creating a task for yourself to go and see to that thing later. Right? Tell your lunch because, you know, I'm not going to get anything done after lunch. Um, that's just how I work. So deal with like, deal with the easy stuff then. Um, plan your day out. <coughs> which leads on to my next point, which is about sorting out your to-do list. Um, identifying tasks that are maybe similar, um, that don't need you to be at your best. Um, and doing them all at the time of the day where you're not at your best. And then thinking about, okay, well, I'm at my best in the morning, or maybe you're, you know, maybe you're the, at the best late, late at night. A lot of um, developers I've worked with like love hacking on code late at night. Understand yourself and know when you're at your best, and then do those tasks that require you to be at your best during those hours of the day. And the tasks that don't need you to be at your best, like writing email, um, do those at the rest of the time. Um, and don't multi multitask. Um, it feels really good, I know. Um, the first time I gave this talk, someone in the audience was like, I beg to differ, I'm fantastic at multitasking. <laughs> okay, thank you, but I thought, yeah, your brain's lying to you, you're just addicted to it. Um, you think you're great, you're not. Um, <laughs> like, just try it the other way, try and focus on one thing. Um, and yeah, um, as I said sort of earlier, um, about, when multi about sorting your tasks and um, doing them at the same time, have that routine that works for you and try and get into it. The more we do these things, the more we build habits, the more we, we reinforce it as a different way of working. Rather than having tools and technology govern what we do and when, make conscious decisions about it and reinforce those through habit. Oh yeah, and finally, I always forget this last point, decide what not to do. That's probably, that probably should come at the top because there is always more work than we have time for. That massive to-do list needs to be prioritised and there will be stuff that you never get to. And that is just how it is everywhere. <laughs> um, so decide what not to do. And if you think that the thing that you're deciding not to do is important enough for someone else to do it, talk to someone about it. Um, but uh, until you've decided what you're not doing, it's going to weigh on your mind and you're going to beat yourself up about it. So make those decisions consciously and do something about it. Um, <laughs> I'm just waiting for an opportunity to implement this somewhere. So nap-driven development. <laughs> I think this is a great idea. But did you know that actually taking a well-timed nap during your working day will increase your IQ by up to 15 points? I think, I think that's well worth it. A 15-minute nap. I don't know. I think it's a 15-minute nap and 10 IQ points. Whatever. Like, if I'm going to be smarter after a 15-minute nap, and I've got like a big ugly problem to tackle. Why not take that nap? Um, but seriously though, um, taking naps is just one example of how you can replenish your mind um, for maybe the next task that you're gonna go on to. Instead of jumping from one thing to another thing through another thing, which is gonna gradually deplete you and make you worse, um, take those breaks to refuel. Take a nap. Um, Take a break, um, get up from your desk, do something different, go outside. Um, don't skip meals. That glucose um, that's in your blood that your brain needs comes from somewhere, it comes from your food. Um, don't skip meals. Uh, weird correlation, I know this, this is gonna sound really strange, but apparently chewing gum um, increases um, the flow of oxygen to the attentional system in your mind. Um, it makes you more able to produce long-term memories and regulate yourself chew gum and allow yourself to daydream so during our working day we quite often feel guilty if we allow our mind to wander but we can't always be in that central executive mode we can't always be switched on um, we need to allow our brain to do both um, otherwise it will get tired and you won't be at your best um, so just allow yourself to daydream maybe not all day but um, for a little while and also having a hobby. Um, so whether it be cooking um, or playing sports or knitting, having something that you're 100% engaged in that doesn't require that sort of active thought can be incredibly re-energizing um, for your mind. 
Um, for me, what I do is I, I go, I, I draw, I go life drawing. And it's amazing how quickly two hours passes because you're concentrating on a task and actually you're not thinking. Like you're barely thinking about anything, but you're so concentrated on a task. And I imagine, uh, I'm not a sporty person, but I imagine sports are the same because you have to really concentrate on what you're doing. Um, and it's fantastic. It's really good for your brain to do that. So if work is encroaching into your evenings and you're having to give up your hobbies, think again about that because your hobbies are actually making you better. Um, they're making your brain more healthy. Um, they're allowing you to replenish um, before you go back to do your job. Um, and meditation is actually been shown to change um, the areas of your brain that are associated with your attention. So by practicing mindfulness and mindful meditation, it allows you to become more aware of where your attention is. It allows you to be more in the moment and it allows you to exert more control about where you focus your attention rather than everyone else being in control of you. You are then um, the master of your own attention, which is probably a, like, one of the most powerful things you can do. And you can help each other as well. So these, these are all things that you can do just to help yourself, but you can help each other in the, in the workplace as well. Um, if you're struggling with this, just talk about it. Um, I find whenever I talk about the sort of the human side of working in tech, it's something that we very often in our workplaces shy away from. But as soon as you put a name on it, as soon as you put a voice on it, everyone goes, oh, yeah, I get that. I get that. And actually, you, everyone's suffering from the same thing, but they don't want to be the first person to, to admit it. Um, but I would encourage you to. Um, if you think that your team is generating too much email or you're not communicating effectively, or if you think you're getting too much stuff out of hours, talk about it, because there are usually solutions to these problems. Um, one thing you could consider doing um, if you have the opportunity is introduce interruption free hours. Um, so if you're in the type of workplace where you are lucky enough to be co-located um, and you get lots of people walking up to your desk all of the time, I used to get that all the time, I'll just introduce interruption free hours, make it policy. Um, only like in exceptional circumstances do you come and like pull my headphones off during these interruption free hours. Flexible working, um, I think, is fantastic. Um, nobody I've ever met is at their best 100% between nine and five. You're going to have your slumps. You're going to have like the, those periods during the day where you don't get much done. Um, and for a lot of developers, they're great at night. So what does it matter what hours you're working um, as long as you're doing your job, um, which is why I think introducing flexible working has been a fantastic thing for a lot of people. Um, we really need to think again about open plan offices, especially for people who are engaged in that sort of um, really complex problem solving as part of their day job. Uh, I saw a great tweet earlier. I was going to throw it into this presentation, but I decided not to. But um, someone was basically saying, it's like, here, is what, uh, here are all the ideal criteria for my perfect job. And the first point on it was door. I want a door. I want to have a door that I can shut <laughs> so that people don't interrupt me. And I thought that was hilarious. But it's so true. Open plan offices are so bad for creating distractions and interruptions. So it's not just our technology, but it's actual people all around us that are disrupting us. And it's that novelty bias. Again, if something's going on and we want to know about it, um, then our ears are going to prick up or we're going to even just engage in it and we're going to abandon the task at hand. And we can help by being really a lot more intentional about our communication. Do we really need to send that one line email that says, thanks? Um, probably not. Um, it's probably OK to wait until tomorrow when you're going to see the person and say thank you or try to create um, try to create a working culture where you don't generate so many messages for each other um, or you only do it when it's absolutely necessary because every time you send one of those fire and forget um, messages, you're going to generate more coming back. And the more messages you generate for other people, the more they're going to interrupt themselves later, the more messages they're going to generate for other people. And it's sort of 
um, a cascading effect that you, and then you get into this um, sort of communication glut, if you like, um, where no one's getting anything done because you're all just over communicating with each other. So the question that everyone was <laughs> not thinking about is what does it have to do with DevOps, Hannah? Um, so I've been to quite a few DevOps conferences and I've, um, I've heard a lot of talks on how to communicate better and how we need to over communicate. And on the flip side of that, I'm sat here, like I'm overwhelmed with communication and, um, and I don't think that that's necessarily the answer. So the reason that I do this talk and I do it um, from like a DevOps mindset is because I think that whilst communication and collaboration are absolutely core to having a successful um, DevOps culture in your organization, there is an extreme and it's really not good for us. So I think the message is be intentional about your communication. You know, have a conversation um, about your communication, you know, talk about how, to how you talk. Um, because you might find that you're creating bottlenecks in your process just through your communication tooling, nothing to do with automation. Um, which leads me on to talk very finally about human ops. Um, so we are human. Um, we work with technology and we can often approach our human problems like they're a configuration issue and they are different. Um, we are incredibly complex creatures. We need to treat humans as something distinct. Humans are not highly available. We need to rest. We need to recharge. We need to recuperate. Humans get stressed. They suffer from burnout um, and humans have feelings. Um, the health and well-being of your human operators will impact the reliability of your systems. Um, we only need to look at the, um, the poor, tired engineer at GitHub who wrote in the wrong command and completely destroyed, the, like, took down their database yeah. for... Was that GitLab, that was it, sorry. Who took down their, um, who did, took down their database to know that actually this is true. Um, the health and well-being of your operators will impact the reliability of your systems. So if you need to make a case for doing any of this stuff with your boss, that's it. Like How we are as people will impact how the system performs, and that's what we all care about. Um, and your human health impacts your business health at the end of the day. If your people are burnt out and your people leave and you have high attrition and nobody is happy, your business will suffer. Um, so if you need to justify any of this stuff, which I don't think you should have to, um, I think every business owner should want a business that's full of happy and healthy people. But if you need to put pound signs on it, then just talk about the reliability of your infrastructure um, as a side effect of the reliability and well-being of your people. And that's all I got. <laughs>